you for the introduction, Javier, and uh, thank you uh, for hosting this event, the opportunity to, to present. So, looks like I don't, uh, I don't need to do this introduction, because he <laughs> <laughs> has already introduced me, but yeah, just to uh, reiterate, uh, my name is Gabor Sabu. I'm a uh, senior principal engineer at Edwards Life Sciences, which is literally down the street from here. And uh, it's a medic, you know, we're a medical device company. We develop and manufacture uh, life-saving products, heart valves for the most part. We may also make some, some other uh, devices as well, but uh, heart valves are our are strong suit, right? And um, um, I'm an engineer by, by trade. And when I say engineer, not necessarily a data engineer or a machine learning engineer, um, I'm also interested in that kind of stuff, but I'm an engineer who, who does stuff mostly in the physical world, right? So I have experience in, in quality engineering and manufacturing engineering. That's what I've done most of my life, or most of my career at least, uh, for over, over 17 years. Uh, I've been in um, a few industries, so I started in automotive and then I moved on to other manufacturing industries and then uh, ended up in, in medical device, and I, I love it there. <laughs> and um, um, I have a bachelor's in engineering management, um, and uh, I've only used R for, for two years. So I stumbled upon R after unsuccessfully trying to learn a programming language. So I, I tried to learn Python uh, <laughs> multiple times, and I failed. <laughs> I'm like, I was like, I'll never learn a programming language. I don't understand. It's just, it was just so hard, the syntax and everything. And then, um, exactly two years ago, I stumbled upon um, an online course by uh, you guys might know this uh, uh, this person. Uh, his name is David Langer, and he's uh, he's like a LinkedIn personality. And I was looking at one of his posts, and like, and he's he was he kind of like evangelizes R. Like, it's easy to learn. If you're an Excel user, then you can do it. I'm like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. I failed at trying to learn programming, like Python programming. I'll just give R a shot. So I, I purchased his course, and it clicked for me, like, right away. Like, man, this, this is like Excel, the syntax and everything. Obviously, learning a programming language is not, not as easy as learning Excel. There's a lot more to it, but... It was, it was really easy for me to pick up the basics, and then there was no stopping from there. So, um, you know, since then I've done a lot of like data analysis, I've done a lot of like learning, self, both self-learning, instructor-led, I've had a few mentors over the, uh, the past two years, and then somehow I ended up um, kind of conceptualizing this thing that I, you know, I've been really interested in. And um, I ended up developing a package. <laughs> I still can't believe that it happened, but it did. <laughs> so, and then um, last year, I, I, along with a few coworkers, we ended up teaching R uh, to uh, some Edwards employees, which I still can't believe, but again, it, it happened. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it, that just speaks to not necessarily like my abilities, but I think R as a programming language, it's, it's really easy to learn, it's really, really easy to pick up and ultimately master. Uh, I'm very far from mastering, having mastered R, that's for sure, but um, I, I try to learn something new every day. And, um, you know, to, uh, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about, you know, the package itself and like what inspired me and what the package is about, but uh, to kind of promote R for engineering, for engineers. So mechanical engineers, quality engineers, engineers that like work or build stuff in the physical world. I know there's already engineers who use R, but I really want to promote that to engineers. So I started recently started a newsletter on LinkedIn where I kind of like showcase a few scenarios, quite a few scenarios uh, that that uh, that use R. So. I'll talk about that um, in a little bit as well. So just a little, this is more of a personal <laughs> side to this. So like I said, I started 
I started in Excel, like most of us, and I've always been pretty, you know, good at analyzing data. Always been a numbers person, a stats guy, um, that kind of stuff, being an engineer. Um, and um, I even, you know, built custom applications in Excel for s stuff that I, I couldn't find um, anywhere. Like, we use, you know, like, you know, in my line of work, we use statistical applications like Minifab or Jump. Um, and uh, at times, I, I, was, I would lo be looking for certain, say, graphical techniques, and I, I just couldn't find it. I'm like, you know what, I'll just be able to excel, and I, I would. Um, and, but, you know, I, I kind of hit a point where I was like, hmm, this is great. I, I kind of want to improve. I like this, you know, this building of applications and that kind of stuff, so why don't I learn a programming language? And that's when I started or tried to learn Python, but again, I failed twice. <laughs> I haven't given up yet. I actually uh, I have a you know, course purchased and ready to go, but I haven't pulled the trigger. I'll probably wait for, for a little bit. Um, and then, like I said, I, I found R2 years ago, and uh, there's a lot of love for, you know, at first sight, at least for me. And then uh, it all started with just me wanting to build some functions for, for my own use, for my work, right? Some of those graphs that I can find anywhere, and I kind of started thinking about, okay, this is great. Um, I'm finding a lot of, you know, <coughs> utility in this. So why don't I just package this up in a package and maybe <coughs> share it with others? So that's how, you know, the idea of developing a package came up. or. Right, and then, um, and this this was exactly a year ago when I started thinking about it, and then I started building it, um, the functions themselves, and then got into the whole package development workflow, which is not not so easy <laughs> to learn. There's quite a bit of um, you know, it, it can it can be painful, but I learned it at least um, to a degree where I was able to you know develop the package and uh, submit it to CRAN and, you know, got accepted and so on and so forth. So, and this, this all happened in, oh, like, a, you know, year and a half, right? And um, let's talk about the package, because that's what we're here for today. So, the package itself, it's really, I know that um, many of you come from different backgrounds. I know we have a lot of data scientists, we have data analysts, we have uh, researchers, we have um, maybe folks who just do stats analysis, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I do some of that, but what I do, like in, you know, in my day-to-day is, um, as I've mentioned before, um, I help our engineering teams build, you know, reliable products and, and processes, so quality products and processes. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, prob it Im involves a lot of problem solving, both on the <coughs> development side, think of it as, you know, developing a data product, say an application, right? You want to build that quality and reliability into your product up front, right? Sometimes that happens, sometimes you make mistakes and you release something and then you find bugs or problems that you kind of have to need to react to, right? So there's, there's a little bit of both going on there. So that's what I do, and that's what the package helps engineers do, right? It's mostly a package that provides um, graphical and some statistical tools for, for, for diagnosis of manufacturing, manufacturing related problems. And what those are, I'll talk a little more about in just a little bit, um, but again, it's it's mostly it's mostly uh, a package that heavily utilizes um, other packages. So ggplot. There's a lot of plot. There's there's other excuse me um, graphing packages that it utilizes, and uh, the kind of the kind of data or data sets that are typically used for this kind of diagnosis 
is not the big data type of uh, application where you have hundreds of thousands of you know, observations. Uh, sometimes you can do that too, but it's, it's usually s small data sets. So we're talking, say, 30 observations or 50 observations, sometimes not even that many observations. That's what uh, um, that's what I do. That's what we do, right? So it's instead of dumping data, you know, into a an application or a chart, and kind of like like look for looking for clues or trying to find something. What we do is design those experiments uh, specifically to get an answer. And uh, the target audience for the package itself is it's mostly engineers. So I specifically developed the package for engineers like myself. So quality engineers, manufacturing engineers, R&D engineers, who like build stuff in the physical world. And typically, uh, when I say typically, like some engineers already use programming languages, Python or R. Most of those engineers, they don't, they don't use programming languages. Not yet, at least. So I had that in mind when I was developing my package. I wanted to make their life as easy as possible. So even someone who has no programming experience, like coming from Excel, I try to make the functions and the functionality um, easy for them to use. Now, I'll, I'll actually provide a few examples of what I mean by that. But uh, I've always had my target audience in mind when developing, building this package. And the, the package has been on, on CRAN since late last year. Uh, start with version uh, 0.5 and then at, uh, version 0.6. So I've, I've just released uh, um, kind of like a, um, added some functionality recently. But it's, it's continuously being built as uh, my time permits. And I also use this package. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you want questions in between your presentation? Absolutely. Or absolutely. After? absolutely. Uh, so typically in the world of phys you know, physical engineering, are there CAM solutions that other vendors are trying to sell you or that come with the hardware? But, you know, like how, how is that diagnosis happening currently? Yeah, so that's a great question. So for this kind of stuff, so this kind of problem solving and diagnosis, um, you know, we typically use on the, say, the software side of things or the analysis side of things. We typically use, most companies typically use um, either, you know, specific statistical applications, Minitab being one of them, right? And they have many, many built in uh, canned, you know, graphs and tools and statistic, statistical applications to do the job, right? And that's great. Uh, but a lot of those applications are like you pay, you have to pay for those, and every seat costs say a thousand dollars, so they're not cheap. Um, and a lot of or sometimes they don't, you know, they don't have the functionality that you need. Which again, most engineers uh, are okay just, you know, with just mini tab, right? But I've always been the one where, you know what, mini tab has a lot of functionality, and this graph is kind of what I'm looking for, but I've always found, you know, those canned applications to be limiting, at least to me. So that's why learning R was so refreshing, especially using, being able to use ggplot and being able to build those custom plots, custom graphs. I know it, it you know, it took me some time to learn it, to learn the language and the syntax, but it just unlocked a lot of doors for me. So I wanted to share that with, you know, with my engineer, you know, fellow engineers, right? And, and, and actually, I like that question because what I also wanted to avoid is repetition, right? There's already a lot of good stuff out there, even like free stuff. There's actually some, um, uh, open source um, applications, both online and like you download it. It's R-based. They developed it in R, and it, it, it is like Minitab, 
but it's completely free. It has a lot of statistical and graphical tools already built in, so anyone can use it. So JASP is one of them, and there's another one. Um, I think Jamovi or Yamovi, uh, they're all great applications. So I want to not develop the same thing. So I want to focus on developing those um, graphical techniques that, that are not really readily available to others, right? So bef before we, uh, or I, I go into the, discussing the package and some of the functionality, I want to give you all just a little more context to, uh, to what I do and what um, you know, this diagnosis looks like in my line of work, right? So I want to talk about product quality and reliability, right? So, so when, we, when we think of you know, a quality product or, or a reliable product, Right, and I'm right now. I'm talking about physical products, right? And just to give you guys a little more context, um, you probably have a car, right? You probably have a cell phone, right? So what is what is your expectation um, of your car, Pablo? That it takes me to wherever I want to go. Okay, that's that's a pretty basic expectation, <laughs> right? It's a given, right? Yeah. What else? Can you? Um, AC for the. Okay. Hot summers here That's in nice. Southern California. Okay. Uh, some decent speakers so I can listen to a podcast or something. Okay. Yeah. Right. So those are those are your criteria mm -hmm. for some of those. Even I would say, even I would say, some of those are kind of like they don't necessarily make your car a quality product. It's kind of like a given, right? If it doesn't have ACs, right. like I'm not buying that car, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> but yeah. What about you, Javier? What about your phone? Any expectations of your cell phone? Mm. Well, I have T-Mobile, which has been seeming to fail recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, connectivity when I need it is uh, a given that yeah. apparently is not always a given. Um, let's see, fast internet. Right. Um, that's about it. I don't play video games on my phone. What about reliability, for example? Yeah, reliability right. um, and support, continuous support. Oh, okay. Like I want to know that my phone will be supported for a couple more years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, what I'm hearing is actually like it's good stuff because what I'm hearing is you guys didn't list a whole bunch of things, right? Just kind of the the most important things like top of mind things. But in reality, you may not realize it, but you have a lot of expectations. It's kind of, it's kind of a given, right? If your phone, you know, is not capable, capable of this or that and that, you won't even consider buying that phone. That's why you've probably kept buying iPhones, right? I'm actually but, an Android user. Oh, okay, you are. Okay. Maybe Android, yeah, maybe, maybe. I right? do believe and, uh, iPhones have like a premium product, but it comes at a premium cost. Uh -huh. Yep, it does, it does. Um, but so at, at the customer's level, so at our level, when we look at a product, say a car or a phone or whatever the case may be, right, we have some basic expectations. We want it to be safe, affordable, right, price is, a, is an important aspect, reliable, comfortable, that kind of stuff, right? But when you look at it from the manufacturer's perspective, right? Obviously, the manufacturer has to have those things in mind, but those higher level, higher level things translate to some lower level stuff, right? For for like physical products, a lot of times it comes down to you know meaning form, fit, or function. This is you know the three F, right? Form is social geometry, right? If you 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 wouldn't buy a cell phone that you know, that was shaped like a, like a triangle, right? Because you expect it to be, I mean, that's a very extreme example. But, um, so it translates to these manufacturing or design specifications, right? And each manufacturer, they factor those things into their design, into how they design the product and how they design the manufacture of the product, right? And this is all fine. Just like, it's just like, you know, the, a list of requirements for your app that you're building, right? You need to have the requirements. 
up front. And uh, variation is really the enemy here when it comes to you know these physical products. So what do I mean by variation, right? So we can have variation in the raw materials or components that make up your product, and that's that is huge, right? A lot of times you account for it, but a lot of times you don't. You think you have, but in reality, you haven't. And then that could be variation in the processing, so how you manufacture the product itself, right? And then also environmental and user factors. And this, that has to do with reliability, right? So you can account for those factors, uh, if you don't, they will still come into play, right? And obviously, manufacturers want to minimize variation in the product because you, as, cust as customers, you want a consistent experience, right? If your car um, behaves differently than your neighbor's who has the same model, then you will not be satisfied, right? So that's why, for us, like engineers who design and build stuff, variation or minimizing variation is key. It's the most important thing that we do. And um, you could approach this in two different ways. One is, again, building quality or reliability into your product, right? Kind of like up front, design it in, and then now you have all those problems hopefully prevented, right? And ideally, it results in a high quality and reliability product, right? Uh, and I would call this a proactive approach. A reactive approach, on the other hand, is when you don't account for some of these things and they just happen down the line, right? We've all seen it. I've, I've seen it. You've probably seen it, right? And it just causes a deviation from what's expected, right? This could be a customer complaint. Complaint. This could be something that happens in your manufacturing plant when all of a sudden you start making that product that you can't sell, right? So now that now you have a deviation in the problem that you need to resolve, and that that's when diagnosis and diagnosis and problem solving comes into play, okay? And uh, whenever you run into a problem. You ask the question, okay, so why did this problem occur? Why? You always ask, why? Why did this happen? Why, why is this happening to me? <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what you're really asking, like, you know, in, in the engineering world, like, what <clears throat> drives variation, because your real problem is really variation, right? What drives variation in this product characteristic? Again, it could be, this could be a characteristic that you, the final, the end customer, care about. Or it could be just a you know, design spec, something that you wouldn't even notice, but it's important to, to the manufacturing team that makes the product. Okay? And uh, you know, this, is, this is where causality comes into play. Causality manufacturing. So, I mean, causality is important, right? So, Causality concerns itself with like why do things things happen, right? It's kind of like in regression, you have a predictor, you have a response, right? It's really that simple. Well, it's not. <laughs> um, but the good news is that well, causality in like the physical world, like in in products and machines and all that. Um, it works because there are certain laws of physics, right? Manufacturing the product, building the product is all about, you know, these laws of physics essentially um, manifesting themselves in the final product, right? There's energy and transformation of energy. You name any kind of manufacturing technology, it's all about managing energy throughout, right? If it's casting, then you, you know, melt the metal and you form it into something that will go into a product that you sell, right? If it's machining, if it's assembly, it's all about managing energy, right? So it's all about 
physics. And what's import important or what's interesting is that when it comes to these physics related phenomena, we have this um, thing called the sparsity of effects. And it means, it just tells us that like any effect cannot be distributed evenly attributed to a large number of variables. So what that means is whenever you, you look at a, an important product characteristic, so say, I don't know, noise level in your car, right? Your car is too noisy, you're not going to be happy. Or you're going to be dissatisfied. You might even take it back to the dealer, right? But sparsity, <coughs> the sparsity of effects tells us that that product characteristic, right, it cannot, the effect of that, there's always going to be one thing that is responsible for driving variation in, say, the noise level between a number of cars, right? So it's not like it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and that, and that. There's going to be one, maybe two things that drives most, that will drive most of the variation, right? Um, think of it as, so say in social sciences, right, say in HR, it's a little different because, you know, we're dealing with people, right, so say, say attrition, like why do people leave a company, right, you can't really always put your finger on it, right, because everyone is different, every person is going to be different, they're going to have different reasons for why they leave the company, right? You may be able to identify trends and say, oh, you know what? You know, more over time has um, kind of like results in, you know, people wanting to leave more, right? But if that's not the sole driver of why people leave. So that, I contrast that to, or with this law. So in physics, there's always going to be one or a limited number of x's or, or you know, variables that affect that y, right? And that's important um, for the, uh, for the uh, methodology that, yeah. Excuse me, can I have a question? Absolutely. So, um, my name is Hong. Uh, very interesting topic. I just want to ask, so does it mean that if we find effect and we can find a problem, and then it will be solved for everything. And so let's say you see some noise in the car, yep. you know the effect, and that effect could like be the cause for almost like noise problem for every car. Could you repeat the last part? Sorry, I didn't. So I didn't when hear I say you. like I'm trying to, to understand the, the, the cause and effect. Yep. Uh, from my understanding, does it mean that? If you see like a noise effect uh, problem from your car, from yep. one car, yep. and you found that, okay, this noise comes from, let's say, the problem A, yep. and then you can assume that problem A, and if you see a noise from another car, yep. from any car within a company on the same brain, yep. and you can like conclude that, okay, this should come from that problem A, because the problem A is the one that try one car. So it means that problem A will be a problem for all other cars. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly what you say, right? So, you're looking at, say, you know, say a population of cars, right? You have a population of, say, a million cars that's already out. People are driving them and all of that, right? And all of a sudden you have a recall. And you, all the cars have, now have to be, are having to be recalled. Right? And you look at it as the manufacturer and you find mm, it's only 20,000 car out of the million, right? It's a small number. What is that? 2%? Or, yeah, 2%. Well, if you think about it, all of those, you know, failures or deviations, right? You need to find what causes it. Otherwise, you'll keep making those car, those noisy cars. Even if it's a 2%, right, of your population, a lot of people are going to be unhappy, right? So you need to find what causes it. And what the sparsity of effects tells you is that you don't need to be looking at 100 different potential causes, right? 
or other effects or excess, right? If you find, if you're able to find that one thing that drives your variation, you've, you've essentially, you've, you've solved the problem. But I can have another follow-up question. Absolutely. So if, if we want to find that effect, but with a very little a sample, let's say you get one car to inspect, you see that problem. Mm -hmm. But how can you identify if that problem is actually the biggest in a lot of things? Or you have to like collect many samples and see if... I mean, I, I'm curious to see how I, you can decide which, which one is the most dominant. It's Why a, you only like do one car? Then? It's a great question. I love your question because that's where I'm going actually. Right? Oh, so, right? so when you think of this, when I put, when I say deterministic, right, the contrast to that would be probabilistic, right? So you need a lot of samples to, to make any kind of decisions or to see if there's an effect. And a lot of times that's true, but what I'm going to show you, or at least try to demonstrate, is that this kind of diagnosis that I do relies on small samples, right? Instead of, again, dumping a lot of data, on yourself and trying to like find an effect, right? You specifically design these studies to answer very specific questions, so you can eliminate a number of possibilities. So let me let me uh, <coughs> let me just uh, go over that real quick. We're still not talking on the package yet, but we will. <laughs> so there are different approaches to like diagnosis, and uh, you may have seen, you know, this. Uh, this technique, uh, it's called the fishbone diagram. Mm -hmm. Are you f you're familiar with it? Yeah, we use I something similar. I'm an egg. We use that for food safety. Okay. So yeah. A lot of variables to try to figure out like why a pathogen happens. Those things plague me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you found them use like to be useful? It, nah, it shows um, attributes right to a problem, but yeah. not necessarily like the weight. Of, yes. of a component, right? That tends to be subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so in, what I found is in for certain problems, these things can be useful. But what I don't like about them, and uh, I'm probably not alone in this, is that these are really, you know, brainstorming tools, right? That you can generate a lot of hypotheses with, right? <laughs> using existing knowledge, right? Team sits sits down and they start brainstorming on like, hey, we have this problem, like in the case of this, like low bond strength of the product or, or a bond. And like, oh, what could it be, right? So what could cause low bond strength? And you start kind of like throwing all these ideas on, on a board, on a chart, right? But again, you're using, you're really using existing knowledge. Or maybe some stuff that you don't really know much about, but a lot of times it, it ends up being stuff that you already know or you have thought of. And that's okay, right? But the, the problem with this approach is that you end up generating a lot of ideas. And like, where do you start? You know, how do you, like you need to start essentially running running um, experiments or something to like, so you can check off these things like, oh, it's not that, it's not that. The problem with the pro this approach is that, again, you can't really test the effect of each of these potential things, right? You just, it's impossible. I mean, it, it will take up so much time and resources, right? So the other problem is that you could have all these ideas, but what if the, X, the X's that actually drive variation are not on the list. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a brainstorm list, right? So you could be missing out on a lot of things, right? And the, the third and the biggest problem is that, again, it's all about time. It's all about effort, right? Maybe, maybe you could solve this problem with the, this list, right? Maybe it would take you a year, right? In a crisis situation, you just don't have that much time. Right, so all in all, for, for this kind of problems, like tough problems in manufacturing, this is a no-no. And there are certain fields where like this kind of brainstorming, <coughs> and maybe food safety is one of them, is actually a good thing. Like stuff that involves like humans, right? I think 
this tool is probably a, a decent you know, tool for it, but not for like manufacturing, physics-based manufacturing problems, um, tough problems, right? If, it, if the problem is something that you already know the answer to, just go do it, fix it, kind of like Nike, just do it. <laughs> so instead, what I recommend and what I, what I try to use, and, and the package kind of centers around or on it, is what I call this uh, progressive search or the process of elimination, right? So, and it's, think of it as binary search. Are you, are you all familiar with binary search? Right, so you have right. a list of numbers that you're trying to find, right? So what you do is, what the algorithm does is you cut it in half, right? Is it in here or in here? Well, if it's in here, that you've just eliminated the other half, and then you, you go and start eliminating <coughs> or cutting things in half. And essentially, what remains must be the number. Right, so that's essentially what it is. Um, so, similarly, you can apply the same approach to solving these kinds of tough problems, right? By asking these very carefully phrased questions um, with the goal of eliminating a set of possibilities, right? So, you're not thinking in terms of like actual X's, but you're thinking in terms of what question can I ask so that I can eliminate a set of possibilities like at a more like abstract level, right? And once you've done that and you've eliminated half of your potential list of possibilities, you can move on and ask the next question, right? And uh, what's going to drive this is the question, what's different? What's different about these two things, these two things that, um, these two contrasting things, right? And, and, and I'll go into what that means. Um, so one of the tools that is really useful for this kind of search is what I call a search tree. And this is just something um, that demonstrates, like, at a high level, how this thing works, right? So you start with this. What draft <coughs> variation in Boston, right? And then... Is it the parts themselves or is it the measurements? A lot of times you have a lot of measurement error in your measurement system. Um, going back to the noise, right? You could have a measurement system that can't really measure noise that well. You have a lot of measurement error, so you don't really know if, it's, if the car that you're about to sell it to this customer is noisy or not noisy. It's an extreme example, but you get the idea, right? So we eliminated measurements. Now your parts, you're looking at the problem, and you're always asking this question where you're able to eliminate a set of possibilities. And what you end up doing is you end up getting to the, you know, essentially the root cause. Because you've eliminated everything else. That's the only thing that remains. And it's, it takes some getting used to, this, this methodology, but it's far more efficient and effective uh, than just brainstorming. And why do I bring this up? Is because you know the, the package focuses on this technique using small multiples. Are you familiar with small mm -hmm. multiples? Yes. If you've used ggplot before, you are. <laughs> so, and that was generated in ggplot, right? So, uh, Edward Tofty. Uh, data visualization expert um, coined the term, and it's really just instead of you know plotting everything in one chart, you're really like grouping them, uh, keeping the same axes and, and all that. So thereby allowing yourself to compare these groups, right? And uh, again, if you've used ggplot, you, you've probably used faceting. Right, so that's that's essentially what it is. I use a lot of faceting in in the in the package. Right, so always asking the question, what's different? Any questions? Okay, so 
Let me talk about. Uh, oh, sorry. One question for yeah. you. Um, so you're getting into the crux of like yes. why you built the package, yes. right? Um, I was just curious. Uh, you're doing this all self-motivated, self-perpetuated, or were you conferring with like other people on your team, or I should say management? Like, hey, I'm thinking of building this. <clears throat> I, I'm just curious what kind of guidance you got from people At, above you. Absolutely. So I started building this myself, and uh, I'm, I've built it myself, but I've conferred with, you know, my peers uh, and also, like, people external to my company. Some of the people that were the original creators of some of these techniques, mm -hmm. right? Exceptional problem solvers, probably the best in the world. And uh, I have some of those people as my mentors that have, you know, who have helped me along the way. I've, and I've kind of like consulted with them, like, hey, what do you think? Is, does this look good? Or does it need a little refinement? So I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback from them. I've also kind of inventing some of the stuff myself. So it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's been fun. But yeah, thanks for the question. Great question. Yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let, I want to talk about this just real quick um, because I, I, I find this to be important, right? So what's the workflow, right? So what, what kind of workflow do you follow when using this package? And again, my target audience is engineers who are not programmers, not software developers, not data scientists. So I wanted to design the workflow to be as simple as possible, right? So it really comes down to, well, they need to be able to import data from mostly from Excel, text files, CSV, that kind of stuff. Not even databases, right? So we have some functions for that, and I'll tell you why. A lot of times, actually most of the time, you'll go right, jump right into plotting data, right? Sometimes you'll do some minimal cleaning or transformation, and some of the plotting functions will do that for you automatically, but some of them, some of it you may have to do yourself. But it's really importing data, plotting data, um, and then maybe creating a report. I've done some, of uh, uh, developed, built some functions around like, automating uh, some reports. But again, it's very minimal. And again, this is a very minimal workflow. So, um, I want to go over a, a couple of pieces of functionality just to kind of like demonstrate what uh, what we have here so this is more of a this is more of a workflow thing right so I I want to make make it really easy for engineers like myself to create projects you know and, and create the workflow so I created this uh, function called create project folder which all it does it, it really creates a project folder for you along with the subfolders, right? So you have, for example, data reports, images, scripts, and also you can also create like a shiny uh, project template. It even creates the, the R project file for you, right? So it's just something that, you know, makes, makes it easy for people um, using the package. And then I have another set of functions which, which are called load files and load files. All these functions do is really, they're really just wrappers around common functions that read in, you know, data from, say, Excel files, text files, CSV files, right? So nothing new there, really nothing new, right? But I wanted to create a function for these people, something that's easy to remember, something that's easy to use, right? So they don't have to look up, like, okay, what is that, read, read CSV or, like, XLSX, open XLSX, right? So this is a, just a wrapper function around um, some of those common functions. And then the load files function, that's a little more advanced. It has the ability to read in multiple files at the same time and also integrate that with a custom cleaning function that you create, right? And it uses PERT to kind of merge everything together. And the reason why I, I think this is useful is because a lot of times when, I, when I'm running these one-off experiments, right, off of a machine or like a bench, you know, like a lab, in a lab, um, sometimes, you know, I'll generate these 
individual files for each of the parts, each of the units that I run, right? And some of them will have a lot of data points, tens of thousands, right? So I, I needed to f essentially find a function or build a function that allows that will allow me to do this, you know, you know, quickly, right? And then uh, now, now we're getting into you know the plots, which is really the uh, rice and beans of the, the package. <laughs> so this is the what I call the what is called the multivariate plot. It's really a small multiples plot type of plot specifically for diagnosis, right? I didn't come up with this. This has existed since the 50s. Uh, it's a really, really powerful plot. All it, it is, again, it, it, you know, you group your data together based on different levels, different factors, right? So for example, this plot, this plot, you have three groups, right? So you have the response, or the Y is the ID of this, of this component, this assembly. And then you have three groups. One is the measurement angle. You measure it in different orientations. And the second group is the mold cavity number. These parts come from multiple cavities, injection molded components. And uh, the third factor is which location. So it's the bottom or the tip, right? And grouping your data, again, we're talking about this product for the uh, by grouping the data in this way allows you to answer the question most, most of the time is which group varies the most, right? Or do you see any clues, any non-random patterns, right? So what's, do you see any non-random patterns here? Just off the top of your head, even like not even knowing what this is. Four and six? Yeah, right, so those groups are different. But why are they different? Well, we don't know, but they are different, right? So you, now you have a clue to kind of chase, right? So now you know that five and six, or four and six, uh, four and five are different, those, your measurement results coming from, from those molds, right, from those cavities, now, now you can phrase your next question, right? So that's what it allows you to do, again, there's no statistics here, right? We're not even looking at running, you know, t-tests or f-tests or that kind of stuff. We're really just looking at the chart graphically, and you can tell if there's a difference. Okay, so that's essentially what uh, you know these small multiples um, type of charts allow you to do. Um, and then we have a helper function which is really just uh, um, to help some of the uh, um, some help with some of the transformations, right? So sometimes you'll need to normalize your observations, and this is not a not the kind of normalization that you may think of, but it's more of a essentially if you have a a, a specification or like a nominal value, let's say a geometry must meet, right, then you can normalize around that value, essentially moving, so you have these two groups here, right, and obviously they're, they're, there's a taper, right, so there are different um, specs for that. By normalizing that, you've brought everything around the same nominal value, right, so you can tell, like, hey, most of those groups are sitting below the, the, the expected value, the nominal value, but that group that just Javier just identified, they're sitting way above it, so they're different. That's, that's all that is. And then, again, these are all different type of small multiple plots. This is a what I call the poor small multiples plot. Um, this is especially used for, useful for like cylindrical type of shapes, right? It's the same data set plotted, um, you know, from the previous example plotted in a polar plot. Again, looks different. But you can also plot, not circular, but also kind of <coughs> positional. Right? And then you have, again, these are just different variants of the same kind. 
So this is a, a, a Cartesian, right? So an XY coordinate type of small multiple. Um, and then this one has an interactive type um, using Plotly. Uh, I'm assuming you all know, you know plot, the Plotly pack package. Uh, I use that a lot in the package uh, as a dependency. Um, and that allows you to like, zoom in on important details of the movie. And there's, there's an interaction plot. Actually, you may actually find this useful for uh, some, of the, some of the stuff where, you know, this use this to identify potential interactions, right? Interdependencies between two variables. And then uh, there's a few more plotting function, functions, but you get the gist, right? So really centers around small multiple types of plots. And then uh, a couple, there's a couple additional functions. One is uh, I've created a uh, theme. So instead of you know theme, black and white, or minimal, um, I created a, what I call theme Sherlock. And this was really just for me, so I don't even I don't even know <laughs> even know if people will find would find this useful. But um, I like like a minimalistic style, right? So no background, no grid lines, right? So and I couldn't find a canned theme in ggplot that accomplishes that. I've always used like minimal, but I would still have to like kind of like <clears throat> define certain things manually. So I just wrapped that around um, this function. So you start with that and you end up with, you know, that neat and clean uh, looking uh, theme. Quick question about your theme. Yeah. I'm terrible at this, by the way, so I am <laughs> not, um, I'm not throwing shade at you, um, <laughs> for the record. But did you test this for, like, accessibility, color blindness, and all that? Like, I always forget about anything that I'm going to share testing for that stuff. Did you give that a whirl and make sure that it's accessible and all that? That's actually, that's a great question. So those colors... I do have a color, color theme as well, but okay. um, I haven't. I haven't. So to answer the question. Okay. Like, like I said, <laughs> yeah. I'm terrible at it too, so yeah. I was just curious because I'm always um, kind of amazed when people can make things look good and accessible because I yeah. feel like there's an art. So, yeah, it, yeah. It's definitely an art. It's definitely an art. Yeah. yeah. And it's why a lot of government websites are like crap. <laughs> <That's basically. laughs> Yes. Yeah. Can I have just? Uh, I'm trying to connect the dots, but for uh, whatever you are um, saying. So from my understanding, right? So when you see a problem, yeah, and then you will uh, do some like initial analysis to come up with some possible course for yeah. that problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then you use a like a fifty-fifty um, algorithm, I would say, that you will de define which course might be the biggest factor. And then you, and then uh, my question is how the, the chart in the previous slide help for that kind of work? Is it like you plot every courses onto a plot and then when you look at that, you can see, okay, which one might potentially be a biggest problem that, uh, sorry, biggest uh, course that you want to look at? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So to answer the part about the algorithm, right? So there's no like actual ag algorithm. The algorithm is in, in here, right? So it's it's really a you know creative and intuitive, but also it's a, like good engineering, right? So there's 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 no statistics involved. There are some statistics, but it's, it's around conditional probability, right? So think of it this way. Um, if I go back here. Um, like for example, this this could be a good example, right? So depending on this is just a, a like a contri contrived example, right? So knowing the manufacturing technology, right? We were looking at these these tips, right? Per the the specification, we wanted the, we wanted those tips to be completely, you know, in this like in line with one another. Is very important for the application, right? And we were curious to see how they were different, right? We knew, we knew there was like some positional deviation, but we wanted to see if the that deviation, when we put it on a polar plot, right, was that in the same magnitude and in the same direction, 
Like, was it random or was it non-random? Because if it was random, then we could say with very high certainty that, hey, that was the tool that made it, right? But if, if it was random, that, that it, it could have been possible that it was the raw material, right? <clears throat> and, you know, this may not mean much to you, but, like, you need to know the technology. I need to know, put some constraints around your hypothesis, right? But by essentially looking at this, right, some of it is, you know, there's a pretty strong non-random pattern there, but there's also something that's kind of random, right? So a lot of times you get the answer, right? But you need to create those constraints for yourself. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a game, right? As you move along in this search, right, you continuously need to create new and new, new hypotheses, right? Stuff that you can go off of, stuff, stuff that you, 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 that will help you uh, ask the next question and the next question, right? And sometimes it's hard, right? Then you need to get creative and just come up with a different approach. But does that answer your question? I know it's done a long way. No, I think, I think I get it. So yeah. it's, it's some, but my next question is, <clears throat> so it means that if we use that, it's only work for a certain task and should be like, well, let's say I use that package for another company yeah. with like similar work. Yeah. Can they use that? Absolutely. Okay. Abs so, you know, the package itself is industry agnostic, right? It's really about the graphical techniques and kind of the philosophy mm -hmm. behind it. I don't even like mention the, the whole progressive search, like in the package itself, there's literature on it, right? But, um, it's really not necessarily about the charts, but how you use them. Actually, it's both. <laughs> so it means that if people should have like a domain knowledge on what should be used in yeah. what circumstances, yeah, and then they can apply that appropriately. Yeah. Once. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me go back here. Yeah. So. Back to your question. Yeah, sorry. Right? <laughs> that, so, that I think that's the uh, one of the canned, you know, color, color themes, maybe varieties, C or whatever, uh, and that's my color theme. There's, I think, there's eight colors that kind of repeat over and over, and um, I don't know if this is like this is like good for for color blind people, but you know, I try to create colors that are kind of different, right? So I have like a blue and a yellowish, kind of orangish, a red and a black, and there's. But again, there's, it's really the same colors repeated all over and over. So this, I didn't mean to like, I didn't want to like reinvent the wheel. I just create, wanted to create something that's like unique to me, to me what I, I like to use. Okay, I think that's it. Um, as for. As for uh, the functionality, there's a there's a couple couple more things. Uh, I, for example, I have like a Pareto chart that kind of summarizes data, and I think you know folks use that uh, regardless of like what industry they are in. Uh, so feel free to check that one out. It's called Draw Pareto Chart. And then I uh, I want to mention say a few words about the the package development process itself because it was. It was fun. <laughs> it was also <laughs> challenging. So, uh, so first of all, uh, I, I, you know, I had the, you know, the the user, the end user need uh, in mind throughout the process, right? So I was really, I, I really thought hard about, long and hard about, like, hey, these these folks like myself, right? Like, what is something that will be simple for them, right? Both in terms of like workflow and also functions, or even arguments, right? Like I know I've seen <coughs> functions where, you know, there's like 20 different arguments, right? Making the, the function itself kind of like hard to follow. And um, that's why I, I try to come up with like a standard 
naming convention for, for the arguments of my functions. It always starts with like a, a y variable, so response, and then we have grouping variables. This is essentially the, the different facets, right? And then you have, actually, now these are the different colors, these are the, the different facets. So sometimes these are two different things, sometimes they're the same thing. Uh, I wanted to you know, give the user like enough flexibility. And then the aesthetics, that's really just the color, you know, the transparency, that kind of stuff. Uh, again, not everything, but like enough uh, flexibility so that they can tweak things if need be. Mm -hmm. And then the labels, this is just, um, this just allows the user to, um, you know, give their plots like custom labels and, and that kind of stuff. <coughs> but it picks up the, the name of the column and, you know, even the variables. So there's some automation there and there already. And then, you know, there's like interactivity for the most part, it's like a true or false, right? If it's true, then switches over to plot, that kind of stuff. So these are the, you know, that's the gist of it. There's some additional arguments, but, um, but again, like an advanced user can always create these plots themselves using ggplot, but a lot of times it ends up being like a lengthy, mm -hmm. you know, like many, many lines of code. So I just wanted to package it up and let People just call these functions and you know make you know making it easy uh, for them, right? And uh, just one more word. So <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I had no idea when I was going into uh, you know what I was signing up for, but it really is a software development project. So especially if you're developing a package yourself by yourself, uh, you're really the developer, the tester, the project manager. You're the technical writer for the documentation, which is also very, very important. Uh, and also even, even the marketing specialist, right? So you need to, if you want people to actually be aware of your package and use your package, you need to put the word out there, create some tutorials, even videos. I've been wanting to, I haven't had the chance, but you know, that's something I, I want to do because that's the best way um, to, to demonstrate you know, what your package does. So it, it's a lot of work, but at the, at the same time, um, it's also a lot of fun because you get you, you learn a lot. You learn some pro extra programming. You learn some, you know, some Git. You learn some, you know, interacting with, you know, those folks up at Cran. So uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. So I would encourage you to whatever it is, whatever it is that you do or you're interested in, just you know, give it a shot. It's you know, just develop a package if, uh, you know, if, uh, if you want to put whatever it is that you do out there. It's, it's not that hard. And um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, maybe in a, in a, in a, in a follow-up session walk, walk you through, like, how I did it, you know, kind of the basic workflow of package development. I'm very far from being an expert. <laughs> I'm very far. <laughs> I barely get by, but um, there are some some uh, some important steps that uh, need to follow. So that's it for for Sherlock. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so again, thanks for the opportunity, Javier, and all the hosts. And uh, um, if you'd like to, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm very friendly. <laughs> <laughs>